What up? This is Josh Rubin from East West Ending Performance. Today is part one of the context of asthma. Got a lot of notes here in regards to the newsletter I read of Ray Peets. I think it was from the 1980s or 90s, context of asthma. So I want to share some of this information based on my experience of reading his article and share some of my own stuff in regards to maybe what causes it. And of course, indirectly, you're going to hear indirectly ways to actually treat it. And then just some basic ideas in regards to how to eliminate it or what to look for because, you know, many people have it for, and, and some have it for different reasons. We have to think about that. So when it comes to his article, one of the a pretty interesting quote that he put up was, the description of disease seems to change according to the drug being marketed. And I think that's something to think about because drugs are always being changed. They're always being rewrapped, recoded, and used for other things. Like, SSRIs. They're used to treat depression. But now we're seeing them actually be used. We see them a lot in our clinic with people with chronic pain. So just think about that as you're being prescribed something that a lot of the times they're not in it for your own health. They're in it for the dollar. Now according to Ray, increased exposure to estrogen and increased consumption of unsaturated fats because they affect cellular metabolism, guar gum and carrageenan because they suppress the immune system, they inhibit the P450 cytochrome enzyme, which is uh, dependent for phase 1 detoxification of the liver. Basically, all these things, these things are involved in asthmatic symptoms. The main reason is because they affect cell metabolism. So when we think about asthma, we always think about asthma externally, meaning on the surface, what's causing it. But we really have to go deeper, kind of like our nutritional philosophies, in regards to what's causing it at the cell level, what's affecting how our cells breathe, and producing excess lactic acid that's perpetuating a lot of these asthmatic-like symptoms. Now, I forget where I read it, but it was the work of Leon Chitao, osteopath, naturopath. And he talked about hyperventilation. He feels that most people that are diagnosed with asthma, I think it was less than 5%, truly have asthma, and most people are actually hyperventilating. Now, if you do a lot of research on Broda Barnes, Ray Pete, all these different people, hyperventilation is actually a hallmark sign of hypothyroidism. Pretty interesting. So the main goal to actually um, alleviate asthmatic symptoms is actually pre uh, protecting cellular energy and cell stability to alleviate asthmatic-like symptoms, such as thyroid, progest, carbon dioxide. These are all protective. Now, I'm not saying take them. I'm saying regulating physiology to upregulate thyroid, upregulate progesterone, upregulate carbon dioxide production at the cell level to release or relieve edema smooth muscle constriction, and things like that to alleviate a lot of the asthmatic-like symptoms that we're having. Another key point he talked about, he found that asthma was very prevalent with women on the birth control pill, women going through puberty, as well as men going through puberty from being estrogen dominant, women with PMS entering menopause, and sometimes women in pregnancy. And this is because they're going into this phase of life with a hormone imbalance, and they're getting such a surge in estrogen. Now, we'll keep it simple. Estrogen stimulates histamine. And I'll go into it a little bit later, but I'll go into it now. You have histamine receptors in your lung. Anytime you release histamine from any type of inflammation by your mast cells, it binds to the H1 receptors in the lower bronchioles and the H2 receptors in the upper bronchioles. This causes vasoconstriction, vasodilation, which can lead to a lot of asthmatic-like symptoms. This is why people especially asthmatics, are very sensitive to a lot of food additives like sulfites and nitrites, things like that, nitrites. Not only do they cause a histamine release and inflammation in the gut, which exposes you to more allergens in the gut from bacteria, but you'll find that it causes a histamine release. And the interesting thing is most asthmatics are actually sensitive to sulfites, but a lot of the drugs are actually giving asthmatics have a lot of sulfites in it. So we have to think about these things. Now, as I mentioned, going into these phases of life, being estrogen dominant, if we think about it, estrogen actually produces asthmatic-like symptoms because it causes edema at the cell level, alters how our cells produce carbon dioxide, they actually produce excess lactic acid, and it can cause smooth muscle contraction because your cells, when they're inflamed, hold on to calcium and estrogen, which are highly excitable and inflammatory. When we're pregnant, the reason that women get asthmatic-like symptoms is because not only are they going into this with an estrogen dominance or more so a progesterone deficiency, because the progesterone should surge when you're pregnant, it's progestation, 
brings oxygen and nutrients to the tissues and to the uterus, into the fetus, all your organs. Estrogen does the opposite. So if we go into it with a deficiency, we're not regulating our blood sugar, um, we don't have an appetite, we're not eating good food frequencies, we're eating a lot of unsaturated fats, we're not eating a lot of tropical fruits, ripe tropical fruits, things like that, to regulate cell metabolism, or we'll malnourish because we're not getting enough protein when you're pregnant, you actually need to take in more protein, of course, non-inflammatory proteins, to help the liver detoxify from estrogen. So if you don't do that, you can actually end up with an estrogen dominance, which can actually lead to asthmatic-like symptoms. Estrogen itself in this phase actually increases most medias of inflammation, which are known to actually inhibit progesterone production and shift these mediators toward excitation. So the more inflamed you are, the more estrogen that you're producing, the less progesterone you're going to produce, which actually affects our cells. So in a positive way, the main thing to think about is how our cells are using oxygen. So estrogen affects that and causes oxygen deprivation. Progesterone actually helps with that. So we use oxygen efficiently to produce carbon dioxide. Now, if we think about excitation and inflammation, going off what we just talked about, excitation and inflammation from the above or from serotonin, nitric oxide, estrogen, all these things impair mitochondrial respiration. And this is where asthma begins. Your body has two choices at the cell. Produce carbon dioxide and not be inflamed or produce lactic acid and be inflamed. So if we affect cellular respiration, we affect cell energy production. We affect how our cells produce ATP, and we affect how they produce water. And the interesting thing is when our cells are swollen, they take up estrogen, they take up calcium. This causes edema. We don't produce ATP, we don't produce water, carbon dioxide, we lose sodium, we lose magnesium, etc. These are the, all the hypothyroid hallmark you know, signs. So when our cells are inflamed and they're not producing energy efficiently at the metabolic level, Ray feels that this is responsible for a lot of the superficial edema that women that are getting that are estrogen dominant, as well as people that are getting when they're asthmatic, as well as smooth muscle contraction that's causing the asthma-like symptoms in the body because these things are excitatory and they cause inflammation. Now, all these factors in the body, and we'll talk about exercise as well, impair mitochondrial respiration like I mentioned and they tend to shift your mitochondrial which is the energy producing part of the cell the mitochondrial metabolism away from oxidizing glucose which is what our body uses as, as a primary source of fuel it wants to use glucose to produce energy water and carbon dioxide so these things shift the body away from that and shift it towards producing excess lactic acid as well as towards lipid peroxidation which is all inhibitory at the metabolic level, especially to thyroid conversion in the liver. Now, if we talk about exercise, now this is a touchy topic because I'm, we're not against exercise. We're against specific types of exercise, like breathless exercise, and we're against people doing the wrong type of exercise with the wrong exercise variables, depending on the phase of healing they're in. So you have to look at the person, what's going on physiological, and then prescribe the right type of exercise and program var variables, intensity, reps, sets, loads, tempo, all these different things, to meet their needs so you can pro progress them, as well as looking at nutrition pre, during, and post. These are all important factors. But if we look at breathless exercise, according to Ray, this causes a release of lactic acid in the body. This perpetuates inflammation, as well as interleukin-6. Now think about interleukin-6, because we'll talk about this a little bit later on in regards to C-reactive protein. So breathless exercise causes our tissues, or our cells to release lactic acid, our tissues to release interleukin-6 interleukin and lactic acid, as well as stored unsaturated fats, which are going to perpetuate the stress cycle and actually push you more hypometabolic. But at the same time, this causes our cells to sell because they take up calcium and estrogen, which pushes them to produce more lactic acid. Um, and increases prolactin secretion, serotonin uh, secretion, and increases TSH production in the body. And TSH is just as inflammatory as estrogen, prolactin, serotonin, nitric oxide, dioxins, etc. We want to lower it. So maybe if you're exercising and you have high TSH levels, you might want to think more about nutrition rather than exercise or reevaluate the type of exercise that you're doing. Now, if you look at some of the drugs that are given to uh, people with asthma, these are spasmolytic drugs that are intended to prevent contraction of the bronchioles. 
The problem is, a lot of these drugs, because of the sulfites, they actually cause a histamine release. Now, I've talked about histamine a little bit, but this histamine release in the body will actually increase cortisol production, which can lead to a myriad of problems from increased production of reverse T3, increased TSH production, it can block thyroid conversion, it can cause increased glucagon production and cause hyperglycemia, it can inhibit the immune system, inhibit Segay production in the, in, the, um, in the small intestine le leading to candida overgrowth. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Eat muscle tissue, eat bone, it's 100% catabolic. At the same time, it actually can increase free fatty acids in the blood, which perpetuates the body inhibiting glucose oxidation and favoring lipid peroxidation, which is not where we want to be, and actually raise blood sugar. So this can actually push you into hyperglycemic state, and at the same time, push you hyperinsulinemic. Hyperinsulinemia can actually exacerbate um, asthmatic-like symptoms because anytime insulin goes up, estrogen goes up. It does it to help lower blood sugar in the body. So if you regulate your blood sugar, you down-regulate excess estrogen secretion. Now, by in this scenario, by shifting your cell metabolism away from utilizing glucose and, you, and basically favoring lipid peroxidation, pushes it towards the phase of <clears throat> excitation and inflammation, which perpetuates the entire cycle. 